Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I would also like to thank the organizers for putting together this nice workshop and for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present some of the work I've been doing over the last few years. So the title of my talk is Classification of uh, Topological Quantum Matter or Topological Materials with Reflection Symmetries. Um, so I will present um, a classification scheme of um, topological materials in terms of reflection symmetries and then um, highlight three example systems um, where we will see the peculiar properties that these systems uh, exhibit. Um, so of course this field of uh, topological materials has grown quite a lot over the last few years so in this talk I can only highlight uh, a few things. Um, but if you are interested more generally into these classification schemes, I uh, would like to draw your attention to these uh, two uh, review articles um, I have been co-authoring. So the first one has appeared uh, last year, which is concerned with topological superconductors, in particular with nodal topological superconductors, where you can have very interesting flatband Majorana surface state. And the second one uh, is this one, which is um, concerned with uh, all these classification schemes of uh, gapped materials but also of gapless materials um, in terms of various symmetries um, uh, and we discuss both the non-interacting case as well as uh, uh, the interacting case and so this very big review article um, will appear in review of modern physics hopefully uh, later this month. So here's my outline so I will start off uh, by reminding you about uh, a few basic facts of uh, topological band theory um, and then uh, move on to present uh, these classification schemes but I don't want to go too much into the details there but rather focus on three example systems. So the first example system um, are these antiperovskites which can be viewed as uh, crystalline topological insulators. So there's a large family of these antiperovskites and uh, probably uh, as a representative example, I will choose this calcium-3 uh, lead oxide system and show you the peculiar surface states that, uh, you, that uh, these, this system exhibits. Um, and then I will move, move on to a second example. So moving on from an insulating system to a semi-metallic system. So this is this calcium-3 phosphorus-2, which uh, Leslie Schaub already mentioned earlier this morning. And I will discuss also the topological invariants that protect this uh, uh, line of uh, Dirac nodes in the bulk and which give rise to very interesting so-called drumhead surface state in this system. And then if time permits I will move on to a third example namely a topological superconductor with nodal lines which exhibits um, these Majorana flat band surface states. Okay so let me start off by reminding you ab uh, about a few basic facts of topological band theory. So the way I, I, I like to think about this is this is um, um, a, a, a topological band theory is about the classification of band structures and we want to group these band structures into equivalence classes. So this applies um, to insulating systems um, uh, as well as uh, superconducting systems um, uh, so you can describe or, or cut, categorize the band structure of these insulating systems as well as uh, the band structure of Bogley of the chain excitations in superconductors um, and group them into equivalence classes. So if you have an insulating system um, or a superconductor which has a full gap uh, we define equivalence classes in the following way so uh, we say that uh, two band structures are equivalent to each other if we can find a smooth adiabatic deformation uh, that uh, relates one to the other uh, without closing the gap in the spectrum and without breaking any symmetries of the system. So for example if you are considered with uh, non-magnetic insulators we have the time reversal symmetry and this adiabatic deformation has to respect time reversal symmetry. Similarly in the superconductor we have the particle hole symmetry and this adiabatic deformation has to respect this uh, particle hole symmetry. And similarly we can also define equivalence classes uh, for semi-metals. So we say that two of these band structures are equivalent to each other if we have an adiabatic deformation that relates one to the other without opening here 
the gap at these um, um, Dirac points in the bulk. And this adriatic deformation also has to respect these symmetries, so for example, time reversal and particle hole symmetry. And on, on top of these uh, so-called um, non-spatial symmetries, so time reversal and particle hole symmetry, are both symmetries which act at a single point in real space. One can also consider um, spatial symmetries which relate the different points in space to each other. And in this talk, I will focus in particular on reflection symmetries. So uh, I will consider reflection symmetries, which then restrict the possible adiabatic deformations that you can allow to connect different band structures in this manner. And then a very important tool that we have uh, to label these different equivalence classes are the topological invariants. So um, all the band structures that belong to one particular equivalence class have the same topological invariant. And this topological invariant is typically given in terms of an integral over the entire brilliant zone um, of an object uh, of, a, of a Berry curvature. And you also have to sum up over all the field states. And uh, then probably the most uh, um, important feature of this topological band theory is this bulk boundary correspondence, which tells you that uh, this topological invariant is equal to the number of gapless states at the surface. So in the case of these insulators, this uh, could be a Dirac cone state, or if you have a superconductor with a full gap, this could be a linearly dispersing Majorana edge state. And in the case of uh, these gapless system, these surface states um, could be flat bands which connect here the projection of these two Dirac cones in the bulk. Okay, so as I said, I want to focus on uh, reflection symmetry. So I have to tell you how uh, reflection symmetry acts on these band structures. And because we want to study band structures of, of electrons, um, we have to think about how reflection symmetry transforms the electronic spin. And you can figure this out by looking at, at this picture here. So imagine that the spin arises due to some circulating currents. And then uh, you have to think about how do these circulating currents look in, in the mirror image. And then if you uh, look at this picture long enough, you can convince yourself that the mirror symmetry flips the spin component, which is uh, parallel to the mirror plane, but it does not flip the component, which is perpendicular to it. So mathematically, that means you can implement this symmetry in terms of uh, the first Pauli matrix Sx in this case, where the mirror plane is the YZ mirror plane, and it transforms the Hamiltonian like this. And so more generally speaking, uh, we always have uh, this operator R that uh, implements this mirror symmetry. And one can show without loss of generality that the eigenvalues of this uh, mirror operator always uh, are plus or minus 1, because you can absorb some phase in the definition of the electronic creation and annihilation operators. So then uh, you can use this idea, which was first proposed by Theo Fu and Kane in 2008, uh, namely, if you now restrict yourself to this mirror plane, you'll find that the uh, Hamiltonian and this mirror uh, operator R commutes. So therefore, you can block diagonalize the Hamiltonian with respect to these uh, mirror eigenvalues, and you can now define a uh, churn number for each of these two blocks. And you can then uh, form these two objects out of these churn, churn numbers, namely you have a total churn number where you add the two mirror churn numbers from the two blocks, and you have a mirror churn number where you subtract the two. And so importantly, you can now have the case where the total churn number is zero, but the mirror churn number is non-zero. So this defines then a new type of a topological insulator, so-called crystalline topological insulator. And then by the bulk boundary correspondence, you'll find you have also surface states on these surfaces that respect this uh, reflection symmetry. OK, so then we would like to classify now these band structures in terms of this reflection symmetry. And we'd also like to add these non-spatial symmetries, time reversal and particle hole symmetry. And so in order to do that, it turns out uh, you have to um, uh, consider two cases, namely one case where this reflection operator commutes with the time reversal symmetry or the particle hole symmetry, and uh, uh, the other possible case is where it's anti-commutes. So when it commutes, that means that these two blocks of the Hamiltonians have the same symmetry as the original Hamiltonian. When it's anti-commutes, you'll find that these two blocks of the Hamiltonian have actually uh, different symmetry. There's a shift by two in the symmetry class, and therefore also the classification changes. 
So if you then consider all these possibilities, it turns out there are 27 cases you have to consider. And when I first gave this talk, uh, there was uh, Yuichi Ando coming to me and, and telling me, well, 27, these are precisely the number of cubes you have in the famous Rubik's Cube. So you could arrange these uh, symmetry classes in this way. And indeed, this is possible. And uh, uh, I think, I mean, we haven't really fu fully figured this out. But if you rotate then here these different planes of this cube, um, this will correspond um, to some dimensional shift uh, in the classification. <coughs> okay, so here's the answer, uh, the question we want to answer, uh, we want to ask. Uh, and so for these 27 symmetry classes, we want to ask now um, how many different equivalence classes are there? Um, or in other words, uh, for which of these symmetry classes and for which spatial dimension are there uh, topological insulator, crystalline topological insulators. So I won't explain how this is derived, but rather just give you the answer. So here is the answer to this question. And uh, it's both here for insulating systems as well as uh, semi-metallic systems. So in the top row here, you see the spatial dimension of the insulating system. And then uh, here you see these 27 symmetry classes and then you have different entries here. So if you have a zero, this means there exists only one equivalence class, namely the trivial one. So no topological state in that case. And if there's an MZ, it means there is a mirror turn number and we have an integer number of uh, equivalence classes. And then if there's an MZ2, there's a so-called mirror Z2 number, meaning that there are only two different equivalence classes, a trivial one and a topological one. And then shown here is also the classification of uh, gapless systems. And there one has to distinguish two cases. So this first case, FS1, corresponds to the case um, where um, the Fermi surface is at the high symmetry point of the brilliant zone, for example, at the gamma point. And the uh, case FS2 corresponds to the case um, where the Fermi surface is somewhere away from uh, uh, the high, sy high symmetry points in the brilliant zone. For example, when you have two Fermi points like this, which then will be related by time reversal or particle hole symmetry. And the classification is different for these two cases. So don't want to go too much into details here. You can you look some of uh, the mathematical details in this paper here, uh, but rather now go to these uh, three examples that uh, I would like to present to you. Um, so the first example are uh, these Antaperov skites. So as I said, these are insulating systems. So we have to look at this row here. Um, there's three dimensional systems, so D equals three. And it turns out we have a reflection symmetry which uh, anti-commutes with the time reversal symmetry. So it's this uh, symmetry class. And we'll find indeed here we can have uh, non-zero turn numbers. We can have a, a state uh, with uh, Dirac, cone, Dirac cones on the surface. So uh, this uh, uh, investigation of, about the Santa Fe I did together with um, Chen Kai Chu, who is now at the University of Maryland, with Yang Hao Chan from Academica Sinica in Taiwan, and with Yoshiro Nohara from the Max Planck in Stuttgart. So here is shown uh, the crystal structure of uh, this material. So it's so-called anti-perovskite structure. So it's somehow the inverse of the perovskites that we know from the cuprates. Uh, so, you know, in the cuprates you have um, this octahedron formed by the oxygen, but here the octahedron is formed by the calcium atom, and uh, you have the oxygen at the center of these octahedra. So, therefore, it's some kind of the inverse structure of the cuprates. So, then uh, if you do band structure calculation, um, you'll find that uh, at the Fermi energy you have um, a, a band crossing, which then is opened by spin orbit coupling. So only with spin orbit coupling, you have an insulating state. Uh, so spin orbit coupling turns this um, uh, uh, material into an insulating state, um, um, which uh, has a non-zero mirror turn number, as we'll see. So to analyze this, we have uh, derived a uh, low energy tight binding model. And uh, so you see, close to the Fermi energy, you have to uh, take into account the uh, lead P orbitals and the calcium D orbitals. And so you can write down um, uh, an effective low energy model in terms of these um, six orbitals here. And then in order to open up a gap, 
you have to also consider hybridization with these d orbitals and include the spin orbit coupling. So this gives in total um, uh, uh, nine band uh, type binding model, uh, which is quite complicated, so I did not write it down here on the slide. Um, but you can, you can use this nine band model and write down all the symmetry operators explicitly and then uh, check for the algebraic relations among them. And indeed, we find that uh, there are two reflection symmetries. R1 here, uh, which is, um, for example, the XC plane, and R2, which is this diagonal plane here. And both of these reflection symmetries um, aren't I commute with the time reversal operator. So that means we have to look at this R minus case in this big table and can therefore use this mirror churn number. Um, that uh, exists, uh, uh, that we derive from this uh, big classification. And um, yeah, so then you can also lo look at a lower energy model around one of these Dirac points and uh, you find um, uh, that the mass term turns the system into a to topological phase uh, with non-zero mirror churn number. And we have computed this mirror churn number from this 12 uh, uh, band type binding model. And it turns out it's, it's two for both of these uh, reflection planes. So by the bulk boundary correspondence, that means we have two um, uh, surface states uh, which connect um, uh, valence and conduction bands. So this is shown in this graph here. Um, for this first mirror plane, so the first mirror plane was the um, XC mirror plane. Um, so this is shown the surface spectrum along the high symmetry lines. And you see there is a small gap opened here by the spin orbit coupling. Um, and then uh, there appear here um, Dirac surface states, uh, one here and one here, um, which uh, connect valence and conduction bands, so therefore confirming this mirror churn number two. And the same is true for the other mirror plane, um, where as well you see two of these uh, states uh, connecting valence and conduction band. And if you do a constant energy uh, plot uh, at the energy where the gap is, you'll see here these two uh, Dirac cone surface states. So this was for the uh, one uh, zero zero surface, um, but uh, similar analysis can be done for other surfaces. And I find particularly interesting is this one 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 surface, because here you ha don't have a normal Dirac cone surface state, but you have a tilted Dirac cone surface state. So this was explained in uh, Lukas uh, Michler talk yesterday. Um, so um, uh, the low energy theory of this uh, tilted Dirac cone is given by this expression. So you have here, in addition, a sigma zero term, which leads to the tilting, and then a so-called type two uh, Dirac state if this A is bigger than one. So this is a typo here. And so uh, this uh, uh, Dirac cone, type two Dirac cone surface state, it turns out uh, cannot exist in normal topological insulators. And normal topological insulators, this will be forbidden by time reversal symmetry. But here um, we have a crystalline topological insulator. And it turns out this um, term is actually allowed by the reflection symmetry. So this is. Uh, somehow extra feature you can have in this uh, crystalline topological insulators, the so-called type two uh, Dirac surface state. And uh, if you plot here the constant energy cuts, uh, you see that this corresponds uh, here to electron and hole pockets, which touch each other precisely at this uh, Dirac point and then move away from each other again. <coughs> so this is explained in this uh, archive, which just appeared today. Okay, then uh, in the last few minutes, I would talk about the second example, this calcium-3 phosphorus-2, which we have heard about uh, Leslie uh, in the first talk this morning. Um, so this is um, a semi-metallic system. So and uh, this Dirac ring is um, uh, symmetric. Uh, I mean, it's mapped onto itself by time inversion symmetry. So this corresponds to this case, FS1. And uh, it has so-called co-dimension two, so co-dimension two, this is um, the total dimension minus, minus the dimension of the Fermi surface. So in this case of calcium three, phosphorus two, so the total dimension is three, 
and uh, this Dirac line is 1, so this is 2. So we have to go at this entry p equals 2. And then uh, it turns out all that matters is this refraction symmetry. So we have this entry here where, again, we have a mirror number that uh, protects um, this um, Dirac line. So let me explain this in a bit more detail. So here is shown the band structure. So you see here these two crossings. And uh, if you plot here the Fermi surface, you see we have a full Dirac line here within the reflection plane, a Kc equals 0. Um, so here is shown the crystal structure. And we see we have two reflection planes here. Uh, and it turns out that these uh, lead to the stability of this, of this uh, band crossing in the bulk. So in, to, in order to analyze this in more detail, we have also derived here a tight binding model. And here it turns out at low energy, the important orbitals are the uh, dz squared orbitals of calcium and um, uh, px orbitals uh, of uh, uh, phosphorus. So here is shown again this crystal structure now with these orbitals. And uh, we can now read off from here how uh, the reflection symmetry acts on these. So for example, I've taken here this lower mirror plane. And uh, you see uh, this is a, a symmetry here of, of the crystal. And uh, it transforms uh, the orbitals in the following way. So we have here these phosphorus orbitals uh, and the calcium orbitals, which lie within uh, the uh, reflection plane. So this corresponds in the reflection operator to these two entries here. So this one is for the calcium, right? The calcium was just mapped onto itself by the mirror plane. And then here, uh, for the phosphorus, we, because of this orbital character, we have a minus sign, right? So the plus lobe is mapped onto the minus slope. This corresponds to this entry here. And then we have also these orbitals in our low energy model. So they are mapped into the next um, unit cell. Uh, so therefore, you get there these phase factors uh, minus ikz minus ikc. So, so, so that's in this case, it's rather easy to read off this reflection operator. And you see immediately, because uh, of these minuses here, you have uh, eigenvalue plus 1 and eigenvalue mi minus 1 uh, are possible. And if we plot now the band structure um, and label the different bands with respect to these eigenvalues, we'll find indeed at uh, these crossing points uh, a band with eigenvalue plus 1 and a band with eigenvalue minus 1 cross. Therefore, hybridization processes are forbidden. And we can define uh, a mirror number in this way, which simply counts the number of occupied states, a uh, difference of the number of occupied states on either side of this band crossing. And uh, by, de by definition, this is uh, different from zero. Now, there's also another invariant you can define in the system, namely the Berry phase. And it turns out that this Berry phase is quantized due to the reflection symmetry. And it is also quantized due to inversion and time reversal symmetry. Um, so here is shown the Berry phase now computed um, for uh, 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 integration contour along the uh, C direction. And you see when this integration contour goes through this uh, Dirac ring, you find that the Berry phase is different from zero. And the outside is zero. And so because this Berry phase is quantized, this also means that this uh, Dirac ring has to be topologically stable um, because you cannot smoothly deform this Berry phase one to zero. And then there's also a relation here between the reflection um, uh, uh, between this uh, mirror invariant and the very phase. Uh, but most importantly, we find that uh, this uh, non-zero very phase now gives rise to a so-called drumhead surface state. So there's this relation which goes back to Vanderbilt and Dresta, which tells you um, that the very phase um, is equal the, to the surface polarization. So if we have a non-zero very phase here, that means there has to be some extra surface charge, and this has to correspond to an extra state um, on the surface. And this uh, agrees with our calculation. So from the tight binding model, this is uh, the surface spectrum computed from the tight binding model. And we see we have here a surface state. 
uh, which connects the projection of these uh, Dirac rings in the bulk. So here's another picture of this. You see this is actually a 2D uh, surface state, so-called drumhead surface state, which is bounded by the projection of this uh, Dirac ring from the bulk. Um, you can also understand the system in terms of a low energy model. Um, so simply two by two Hamiltonian describes uh, this band crossing and you can figure out how the symmetries act on it. And uh, you can show uh, that there's no gap opening term allowed uh, because it would break uh, reflection symmetry and gap opening terms are also prohibited by inversion plus time inversion symmetry. Okay, I think uh, um, four minutes. You started late. <laughs> I see. Okay, yeah, so let me just simply uh, say a few words now about the superconductors. This will be discussed in more detail by Raquel then uh, on Wednesday. Um, so, um, yeah. So basically, um, uh, these are so called non central symmetric superconductors um, where you have a splitting of the bands in the bulk and you have uh, two different gaps on these two bands which can be viewed as uh, the sum and the difference of the singlet and triplet pairing and you can then generically have in these superconductors so-called nodal, nodal rings which are protected um, by a topological invariant and then similar to this berry phase which I've discussed in the context of calcium 3 phosphorus 2 uh, you have um, surface states which are bounded by the projection of these rings in the bulk. Okay, so let me summarize. So I have uh, talked about uh, these topological materials with reflection symmetry. I've presented a classification scheme for fully gap materials as well as for nodal materials. And I have uh, discussed uh, these three examples. Um, so the first one are these anti perovskites um, where we have an interesting type two Dirac surface state protected uh, by this reflection symmetry. The second one is this calcium 3 phosphorus 2 where we have this interesting drumhead surface state which has a rather small dispersion so probably uh, in, uh, this enhances interaction effects at the surface of this material and uh, as we will hear then tomorrow by Raquel there is uh, this uh, non centromagnetic superconductors uh, which have a similar surface state so called Majorana surface state. So I just want to say three things about these classification schemes. So I think these are useful because they bring some order into this growing soup of topological materials and they give us also some guidance uh, for the search and design of new topological states. Um, so particularly these entries which are zero I think are very useful. So we have some material um, where we know that the symmetries cannot uh, give rise to the topological state and we can discard this immediately in the search for for a topological system. And then uh, also uh, important is this link between the bulk topology and the surface state. Um, so this um, means that just by looking at surface states with RPES or STM, you can infer a lot about the bulk topology of the material. And particularly for the superconductors, this is important because by looking at these surface states, you can learn a lot about the pairing symmetry in the bulk. Thank you very much.